lively talks and a lively discussion as well. It's been very, very nice. So just to move on now, may I request Lika to take it forward. We are all waiting for, for the exciting next talk. So we have um, John Granfield with us. Uh, he's going to give a talk on a conversation with an astronaut, scientist, and human solar cosmic ray detector. Now we have talked about cosmic rays quite a bit in this um, session, but we haven't talked about a human cosmic ray detector. So if I can have the next slide, John's bio. So uh, John is a veteran of five NASA shuttle flights and has visited the Hubble Space Telescope three times. I mean, that's pretty amazing during these missions. He also performed eight spacewalks and has logged more than 58 days in space. He has previously managed the science program for the Hubble Space Telescope and the James Webb Space Telescope that just launched, you know, in fact, I announced the L2 insertion, I think on this, um, not this uh, day, but few days ago in this workshop. His background includes research in high energy astrophysics, uh, actually cosmic ray physics and exoplanet studies with interest in future astronomical instrumentation. John was also my former boss at NASA headquarters as the associate administrator for science um, for a few years. Uh, I'm seeing John after two years, of course, on screen. Great to see you and really thank you for uh, taking this on, John. Well, it's really a pleasure to be here and, and Lika, thanks for uh, inviting me. Uh, and hello to all of you, both in the US and in India. Uh, I think of Lika more as a collaborator and a colleague than a, you know, a boss relationship. Uh, we had a great time and uh, advanced a lot of science together. Uh, I'm going to share my screen, and hopefully that will that will work, and show you a few slides. And so one of these. There we go. So hopefully you can see. My presentation. Yes, it's perfect. It's perfect. Great. All right. So as uh, as Lika said, I'm uh, an astronaut and and a scientist. And actually, my my areas of research have actually shifted a little bit over the last uh, four or five years. And I'm now using the Hubble Space Telescope uh, and Sophia Observatory uh, and hopefully soon James Webb to look at the moon of Jupiter Europa to see if we can see plumes of water. Uh, in fact, there's a SOFIA uh, observatory proposal deadline tomorrow that we're working to finish a uh, proposal for. But I, I'd like to take you back uh, about 40 years. And this is the incoming class of graduate students, 1981 at the University of Chicago. And I went to the University of Chicago to do cosmic ray studies, following in the footsteps of Compton and Fermi, uh, but using high altitude balloons. That was my passion. And so you can see me there in the front row. Uh, I had a lot of hair, uh, still the same mustache. And I'm one of the few that's wearing a jacket. I don't know why I was wearing a, you know, a jacket like that. Um, but I want to point out another graduate student who was with me, Sandeep Chakrabarti, uh, and I think he gave a talk earlier in the program uh, talking about the Indian balloon program and his work at the Institute. Uh, we were graduate students together. I went to work in experimental astrophysics, and he worked with uh, Professor Chandra Sekhar in theoretical physics, uh, studying black holes and such. So different trajectories. Um, so it's interesting though, that even though our paths have you know, taken many different routes, we end up back here 
at this workshop. I think that's very exciting. Uh, and there's, you know, something about a small world in that. Uh, there are also some other interesting characters there. Uh, Barrett Milliken, who with Nobel Prize winner Jim Cronin measured the pine knot lifetime. Uh, Joan Candela, who uh, worked at CERN uh, and, you know, made a number of, of discoveries. Giles Novak, who is still flying high altitude balloons at Northwestern, uh, looking at all kinds of interesting things. I wanted to kind of uh, couch my philosophy about what NASA does. And I can never remember the pithy statements that NASA asks us to remember about you know, the, the NASA mission. I tried to keep it very simple. I think NASA's mission is to innovate, to create new tools uh, for observations, for human exploration, to enable us to explore. And that's what people do best. You know, we explore our world, we explore the cosmos, we explore, you know, the interstellar medium, the interplanetary medium, the sun, and those connections. And when we explore, we discover things. And when we discover things and tell other people, we inspire. And so that's, I think, the, the real mission of NASA is to inspire a nation and the world and create innovations that allow us to explore and discover. The neat thing about the sciences at NASA is that we ask big scientific questions. Where did we come from? Where did the universe come from? Where did the chemical elements that we're made out of come from? Uh, you know, how, where did the earth come from? How did life start on earth? Where are we going? You know, what's the trajectory of our sun, the history of our sun in the future? Uh, what is the future of our Earth's climate, biodiversity, the future of our solar system? Uh, where are we going as humans? Back to the moon, to Mars? How long before we can go to uh, planets around nearby stars? And a big question, which I think is one of the most interesting, is the question of are we alone in the universe? I saw in the chat somebody asked Bill Diamond, you know, is SETI searching for little green men? Uh, and that's for Bill to answer. But I think this is a, a really interesting time to be asking this question, because for the first time in human history, we have the technical means, both the telescopes, the instruments, spectrometers, um, but also uh, things like gas chromatographs, gas uh, mass spectrometers, to be able to go to planets or moons of planets like Europa, Enceladus, Mars, uh, and investigate the question of, was there life in our solar system beyond Earth? Is there life now in our solar system behind Earth, beyond Earth? Um, I think Europa is probably one of the most interesting places to look for current life, um, and, but that's the topic of a whole nother talk. The other thing I really like about the science and what you've been discussing here and that the science that NASA funds, and, and it's true in India as well, is that even though we divide our topics into say heliophysics, earth science, planetary science, and astrophysics, you know, well, the sun is really a star, which is what we study in astrophysics, uh, and the earth is a planet, which we study in planetary science. And so really, those boundaries are artificial and it's an integrated program of science and something that, you know, Lika worked very hard on is on the connections between all of these fields. Now I couldn't give a talk and not show you uh, a space launch, um, a space launch that I was on and of course a rocket launch. So here we are going out to the launch pad. This was 2009, the last time I went to space. That's Scott Altman, our commander. We got into the space shuttle a few hours before launch. The last, uh, Megan MacArthur was the last one in. It's a great day to go fly. On behalf of the KSC processing and launch team, I'd like to wish you, your crew, and the whole Hubble Space Telescope team, uh, a great mission. Good luck, Godspeed, and we'll see you back here in about 11 days. 
So with that and about 10,000 people all doing their job right, we lit the engines on the space shuttle. And off we go. For about the first two minutes, we're riding on the solid rocket motors, those big white cylinders. And once they run out of fuel, we separate from those and continue on that large orange tank of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen uh, for another six and a half minutes. So eight and a half minutes after leaving Florida, we're in orbit at about 500 kilometers, traveling 17,500 miles an hour. Now the whole shuttle system is reusable. Uh, of course, it's retired now, but the only thing we would throw away is that orange tank, uh, which would empty, would burn up in the Indian Ocean. And it's interesting to note that the fraction of the space shuttle system that was reusable is actually greater than say a SpaceX Falcon 9, even though we think of that as a reusable rocket now. Uh, it was really the space shuttle that pioneered reusable rockets. So once we got to orbit, it was time to uh, go out and do the spacewalks. And so this is a picture of me. Hopefully you can see that I have a big smile on my face. Uh, this is just something that I love to do is to get into a spacesuit, uh, go outside, uh, that spacesuit holds uh, pure oxygen at uh, 4.3 pounds per square inch. Uh, in the backpack, I have oxygen. I have a water supply, which is part of the cooling system. I have batteries. I have a lithium hydroxide canister that scrubs carbon dioxide out of the suit because I breathe out carbon dioxide, of course. Um, and an emergency oxygen pack uh, you can see on my helmet, there are some cameras. There's lights, high and low beams, uh, and all of my tools. Uh, we have to make sure all of our tools are tethered so they don't float away. And in the background, you can see the wing of the space shuttle and some of the equipment. Uh, if you look closely, you can see that in my visor, the plastic visor is a reflection of the earth. And this is just one of the most amazing things for a human to do. Uh, to go outside of the space shuttle into Earth orbit. Um, and it also really answers a fundamental question that uh, people used to ask me all of my life uh, before this. They said, John, uh, do you work in a vacuum? And so now I can legit legitimately say, yes, I work in a vacuum. John, your volume has become lower than before. Huh. Can you please come closer to the microphone? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let me uh, adjust that. It may be directional since I moved it. Hopefully I didn't lose that microphone. How's no, that's that? good. It's good. Okay, very good. Um, so this is actually the Hubble Space Telescope mounted into the payload bay of the space shuttle. And you can see me on the left. I have a red stripe on my suit and that's my partner, Drew Foistel. And we're preparing to remove a camera from Hubble and install a new one. We've serviced the Hubble five times. I've done three, but astronauts have gone up five times. And each time uh, we reinvent the telescope by putting in new scientific instruments, taking out the old ones, putting in new ones, and also fixing bits of avionics, of electronics that may have failed. In fact, the solar panels on Hubble, uh, we put new ones on in 2002, replacing uh, the old ones with brand new gallium with a multi, uh, high efficiency uh, gallium solar rays. So Hubble hopefully can last another decade. And now that we have James Webb Space Telescope up, uh, we're really excited about both telescopes being able to observe things. Once we did all of our spacewalks, we let go of the Hubble Space Telescope and uh, sent it on its way. We did five spacewalks on this mission, I did three. And that gave us a chance to get together as a crew and have a meal. I like to uh, hang upside down like a bat. Of course, there is no upside down when you're in free fall. This is Drew making a sandwich. And you can, really fun in space that you can do things like just let go of your food and it doesn't go anywhere. I always encourage children to try this at home.
uh, my son, who at the time was, was rather young, asked me to take a picture of a ball of water. So this is a ball of water floating in the cabin. And when I went to take the picture, I realized that of course it's, it's a convex lens and it should magnify and invert the image. And of course it does. And then I asked Drew to get very close. And you can see that if, as we expect, uh, it magnifies his eye. That's you know a big view of his eye. When he got a little bit closer, it hit his skin and spread out because of surface tension. One of the things that's really engaging is to look at sunrises and sunsets. Uh, this is an, a picture I took, it happens to be a sunrise. And one of the things you can see is the very thin earth atmosphere. That picture uh, and the thickness of the atmosphere is a little over a hundred kilometers. And so the, the five or so kilometers that we can survive in uh, is, is even just a fraction of that 1 20th. And the other thing to think about in this picture is what we're seeing is the light transiting through the Earth's atmosphere to the camera in the same way that Hubble and in the future James Webb will do, doing transit spectroscopy of planets around nearby stars. And so when you look at how thin that is, and then you think about that 20 or 30 light years away from Earth, how small the signal must be, it's just really incredible. Now we had bad weather in Florida, so we had a couple of days to play around on, in orbit, waiting for the weather to clear up. Uh, that's a little ball of orange drink. It actually is Tang. That's Mike Good uh, drinking a ball of, well, eating a ball of water. This is uh, doing some physics experiments, the stability of solid objects in rotation about various axes conservation of angular momentum. And here's the uh, commander and flight crew playing video games. They're playing the land of the shuttle video game, which is actually part of our training on orbit because we'd been in space for two weeks and we wanted to make sure that Scott Altman could fly the space shuttle and land us safely. So finally we got uh, clearance to come back, but instead of going to Florida, we were told to go to California, to the Edwards Air Force Base, our alternate landing site. We got back into our spacesuits. Scott Altman put his California music on. Megan said, get to work. About 5,000 miles from California, we did a deorbit burn. Uh, and actually the space shuttle smashes into the atmosphere, uh, traveling five miles a second, seven kilometers per second that heats up the outside of the shuttle to almost the temperature of the, the sun, the photosphere. Uh, after uh, blasting through, we eventually slow down below the speed of uh, sound. Here we are at about 12,000 feet, 4,000 meters, doing uh, 300 miles an hour, 300 feet, 100 meters above the ground. We put the landing gear down and then land on a runway. Uh, that's about three miles long. And Scott did a great job of smooth landing. We put out a parachute, mostly so that the nose gear doesn't hit too hard. It pulls on the tail there. We get rid of that parachute and then use the shuttle brakes to roll it to a stop. All in all, we traveled about 5.4 million miles, 178 orbits of the earth, did five spacewalks, repaired the Hubble, uh, and had a, had a very successful flight. Now the question is, uh, you know, what does the Hubble observe? But before that, I wanna talk about uh, my experience in space one evening as we flew through the South Atlantic anomaly. Now I usually sleep really well uh, in space, very soundly, but, and we, when we go to bed at night, because the space shuttle was orbiting the Earth every 96 minutes, we had 16 sunrises and sunsets a day. So to help us sleep, we wore eye shades and earplugs, uh, and we had sleeping bags. And I used to sleep in the airlock because it was nice and quiet and cold. But one night I woke up, I had my eye shades on, and there was a light show going on inside of my eyeballs. And I immediately recognized 
uh, that this was, you know, mostly single ionizing radiation. Uh, and I was so fascinated, I couldn't go back to sleep. So I started looking very closely. And mostly it was a lot of little tiny white dashes, uh, you know, at a rate that was uncountable, you know, maybe hundreds per second. And so these must have been singly ionizing particles. Uh, and electrons don't make it through the aluminum very well. Uh, so most of them were protons, solar uh, energetic protons. Uh, occasionally, I'd see something much brighter. And I tried to calibrate it. And, you know, I would say it was 100 times brighter or so. Uh, and so I think that was carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen cosmic rays. Uh, and then occasionally there's something super bright, which I think was a, a charged particle, the DEDX, uh, going right through my retina. Um, I wasn't able to stereoscopically observe anything, which is another indication that this was radiation. Um, but it was kind of neat to be able to actually, in a sense, qualitatively analyze uh, both the species, protons, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, maybe a little brighter neon, magnesium, silicon, the occasional iron. But also because of the color, I could tell the difference between scintillation because of the organic molecules scintillating uh, from the energy loss in the vitreous material of the eyeball and Cherenkov radiation, which was extraordinarily dark blue. Um, so it was a, a neat experience being a, a human cosmic ray detector. Now, the big question after one of these missions, after we land is, does the Hubble work or did we break it? And I think you all know, uh, because I'm talking to you and I'm not in exile hiding somewhere, uh, that it worked beautifully. And uh, the Hubble Space Telescope is really helping us to answer and has helped us to answer many mysteries of the universe and generated new ones. This is a picture of the Hubble Deep Field and other than a couple of foreground stars that are from our own galaxy, every little dot in this picture is a galaxy like our own with anywhere from 50 to hundreds of billions of stars. And in this picture alone, there's about 10,000 galaxies. Uh, so if you download this picture and the site to download it is at the end of the talk, but every little tiny dot, a little teeny single pixel red dot is a galaxy with billions of stars in it. Now, of course, you know we live in a galaxy. Uh, we live in a beautiful spiral galaxy. Uh, this is an, uh, a face-on spiral galaxy as, as observed by Hubble. And we can see a number of star forming regions and lots of gas and dust and a bright nucleus. Uh, you know, maybe there's somebody out there with a, with a telescope looking at us this way. Um, just beautiful pictures from Hubble, enormous amounts of science. And even in this image in the background, you can see other galaxies. Now closer to home, this is one of my favorite images from Hubble. And this is the Great Nebula in Orion. And if you're familiar with the constellation Orion, you know that it's a great hunter. It has three stars in the belt. It has three what look like stars in a sword. And that middle star in the sword is actually not one star at all, but this great nebula of gas and dust in this case, glowing in the ionized light of oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, and hydrogen. And inside are a number of very young, massive stars that have turned on within the last few million years. John, and you have I'll, about five minutes. The pictures yep. mesmerized me, and I forgot to give you the time signal. Okay, uh, that'll, that'll work just fine. Um, and inside are not only planet, uh, stars forming, but also planets forming. And we, if we zoom in, we can see uh, you know, the evidence of those baby solar systems being born. But this picture also tells us, as Lika said, that the universe is much more beautiful than we ever imagined. And that's one of the contributions of Hubble. Now, closer to home, uh, you know, we, we live around a star. I think you all know that. The average person on the street forgets that our sun is a star. Um, and you know, of course, this is a, an amazing solar dynamics observatory picture, and it has provided us just incredible views uh, of our sun that never cease to amaze me. Uh, and 
with new observatories, with the Parker Solar Probe. Gene Parker was my professor, uh, you know, and, and probably Dr. Uh, Chakrabarty's as well. Uh, Gene Parker taught us electricity and magnetism, and he was a wonderful professor and is just a really neat guy. And Parker Solar Probe uh, is an amazing mission. But I also want to bring up, and you've probably discussed it here, the Daniel K. Inouye Solar Telescope, which I consider to be the Hubble of solar astronomy. And this is the first light picture. Um, I'm sure you know all about this, but it being able to see the sun with details the size of Texas. Now, Texas is big. Um, but to really be able to get these up close and personal pictures with, with the NUA telescope is going to be truly remarkable. So finally, the James Webb Space Telescope. This is a project I managed for a number of years. I think Bill Diamond has already talked about it, but it's going to be able to go where no Hubble has gone before. And, and let me just quickly, as I wrap up, play you the video. Um, JWST deployed correctly. It was launched in almost the perfect trajectory, so we saved lots of fuel. Uh, the solar panels came out, the antenna came out, the radiator uh, trays uh, came out just fine. Um, this was the really scary part after this, was the deployment of the sun shield. Um, this is the telescope lifting up, uh, and then we deployed the five layers of sun shield. And you'll see that. Uh, James Webb is now at Earth Sun L2 and it's in its orbit around that imaginary point. Um, the mirror wings have been uh, deployed and all of the mirrors have been moved out of their launch lock position. Um, and so the next couple of months, we're gonna be aligning those mirrors, commissioning the instruments, and then we'll get the first images uh, from the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, and what excites me the most is not what we know we will discover, studying exoplanets, looking at the very first stars and galaxies in our universe, looking at planets in our solar system. It's those things that James Webb will discover that we don't know what to ask right now because we'll have never seen those things before. Uh, so that's the uh, deployment of the James Webb Space Telescope. And uh, I think our future in science looks pretty incredible uh, with all of the future instruments and planetary science and ground-based observatories. If you wanna learn more about James Webb Space Telescope, you can go to worldwideweb.jwst.nasa.gov and all of the Hubble pictures are available at hubblesite.org. So thanks and I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, there are a few questions. Um, maybe we'll take just a few. Uh, so th this is a question you will like uh, to answer. Uh, the question is, um, as you go to Hubble telescope, will other, as well, I guess, as you went to Hubble telescope, will other astronauts go to JWST for some modification? <laughs> so a, a couple of things. Uh, the first is that James Webb is a much uh, more complicated telescope than Hubble because instead of being a room temperature telescope, you know, like, uh, you know, 21 degrees Celsius, it operates at 40 Kelvin. So the whole telescope will cool off to that temperature. Uh, in fact, the MIRI instrument has a cryocooler that gets even colder. In order to build it that way, they had to build it uh, very complex and in a way that humans can't adjust it. There are no removable instruments. There's no electronics that's updatable. And it's a million miles, 1.5 million kilometers away from Earth. And we don't have any plans to build spacecraft that would be capable of going out there and not wrecking the James Webb Space Telescope. But the telescope was designed to last at least 10 years. And unless something breaks now that it's all deployed, there's no reason it won't last now for about 20 years. That said, the next telescope, the Roman telescope, uh, has some serviceability built into it. And I think all future telescopes uh, will be serviceable by robots or astronauts. 
Another question, um, does the overall outlook of life of an astronaut change after their space flight? I think it depends on the individual. I mean, certainly our lives change because, uh, you know, we've had this privilege to go out into space. We can talk to schools and, and people and hopefully inspire them. Um, but as far as I think my, you know, my driving reason to exist, which is curiosity and science and the interest in sharing science with people, uh, that really hasn't changed. Um, you know, I saw a very natural progression from being, you know, a curious child interested in science to becoming a, a physicist, flying experiments in space, then me going to space and operating telescopes and fixing the Hubble, and then coming back and still having a scientific career. I think there's some astronauts who perhaps in their earlier life never really thought about the fact that the earth is a planet, the sun is a star, that the earth orbits the sun, that we live in a galaxy filled with stars. If people have never thought about that, then maybe, and it's certainly true that many astronauts who then suddenly discover this and see the earth and, and realize sort of the, our place in the universe, that, that for them, it changes their whole personality and their outlook on life. One last question. Um, and, and there are many questions. If you have a few minutes and you can stay on, actually, you should stay on for the next talk because it's on Parker Solar Probe. You haven't seen these images probably. So the next question is, what was the most uh, challenging situation you faced in your career as an astronaut and how did you deal with it? Uh, I think the most, well, there were two, two challenges, one of which is, of course, being away from family and friends, you know, for long periods of time while training, uh, and then go, you know leaving the planet uh, in a very high risk situation. Um, but but for me, I always love the technical challenges. And on the final mission, we repaired the advanced camera for surveys, which is the camera that uh, a team, uh, Saul Perlmutter, Brian Schmidt, and Adam Reese used to win the Nobel Prize in Physics uh, in 2011. But this camera was broken and it was not designed to be fixed. You could put a new camera in, but we didn't have one. And in order to repair this camera, I had to take out little tiny number four screws and pull out circuit cards and put new cards in. Uh, and this is something that people had never done in space before. Uh, and so I used you know, a very straightforward method to solve this, but it was still very challenging. And that straightforward method was to develop really great tools with a team and then practice, practice, practice. Every night I would practice uh, this task for months so that when I got to orbit, all the mystery should be gone. And during the practice, pr you know, with a mock-up, we found lots of things that could go wrong. And then we developed techniques to overcome that. Well, when we were actually doing, when I was actually doing it in space, just about every single one of those things that could go wrong did go wrong. But because we would practiced so much and found all those things out, we already had fixes and I was able to overcome them. And, and fortunately, now we have an advanced camera for surveys that's still helping scientists unravel the mysteries of the universe. Thank you very much. Uh for this uh, talk and interacting and answering the participant questions. And we would love for you to stay on, answer a few will. questions I'll, if you can. Yep. And I would ask Deepankar, who is our host at ARES, uh, if we could get a group picture taken with John. Certainly, certainly. Uh, so, all right. And then on over to you, Deepankar. Yeah, so may I request all the participants to turn on uh, their uh, cameras. It's a great opportunity for us to have a group picture uh, with John. Yeah, and I would request my colleague to start taking some screenshots. <laughs> we have to move to a few uh, 
different uh, screens because we can't accommodate. We have more than 120 people on board now here. And there are many actually in the YouTube and Facebook channel. Thank you very much, John, for allowing us to uh, like dedicate this. And I'm sure the recordings will be also a treasure for all of us. My pleasure. So thank you very much. I think we have taken the screenshots, yes. Thank you.